Hey, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games, and on today's episode of Game Maker's Notebook, I had the pleasure of chatting with Stig Asmundson. He's the game director of Respawn's Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Stig has been a creative leader on some of the biggest games in the industry, and he talks about what every game director or creative director should know. We dive into Jedi Fallen Order, and we talk about some of the tougher decisions that led to an absolutely amazing game. Please join us for a fantastic conversation. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. It is great having you here. Thanks. Thanks. It's an honor being here. I have to say that I have been playing a ridiculous amount of Jedi Fallen Order lately. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually haven't played many Star Wars games, and I got so hooked on this because of its Metroidvania aspects. I'm a Metroid fan, and I. But but what you have done with the game is stupendous. And I want to spend a lot of time talking about it. But first, I want everybody to understand who you are and, and what your background is. And I have a, a question to start. Uh, your dad is an engineering professor, right? <laughs> yeah. He is. And, well, uh, he retired now, finally. Okay. <laughs> he did some pretty amazing things. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got a, he, he started up a, uh, a big research center at Michigan State University uh, for uh, creating these incredible machines that, like, you know, they used to talk about turning uh, straw into gold. Well, he was uh, on the forefront of, of building uh, uh, diamond uh, film technology um, with just a handful of other companies that are doing similar work in the world. So, um, yeah, he's he's had a he's had a great career and been very inspiring for me. Did you want to be an engineer when you were a kid? Absolutely not. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, there's this thing called math that I'm not really that into. Well, so how did you get started doing art? What was your inspiration? You know, I think... Even before art, I mean, I was as a kid, you know, all kids draw, and I, I, I think I with my drawings, I used to try try to tell stories, and they were usually action oriented. Um, a lot of times, they were violent, um, and I would act those out with you know Green Army Men and uh, Legos, and um, that just just kind of became this thing. It's like I was always, I was always, I was the youngest kid by far. Uh, Far shot. My brother was eight years older than me, my sister 12. So oftentimes I found myself playing by myself. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times that was just using physical toys. And then games came out. Um, since my my dad and my stepdad were both engineers, um, we had computers very young. And um, they, they weren't really into like consoles and Atari and that kind of thing. So we, it was you had to be a little bit more sophisticated to use computers back in the day. Like, I'm sure you can remember like the TRS-80s. Absolutely. And, um, like I'd get home from from school and I'd put Space Invaders inside the cassette drive. Yep. <laughs> and I'd go make my snack and like, you know, <laughs> half an hour, 45 mi- minutes later, this this game would be loaded on it. So it was it was art. It was games. Um, really more than anything, it was about creativity and playing and, and expanding my imagination. And, um, and uh, when I started to get more t- into like the... You know, middle school and high school, I started taking art classes and uh, architecture and drafting. I even before I graduated from high school, I, I went to community college nearby um, just to, to start taking college level um, architectural and drafting classes, and that's what I pursued uh, right out of the gate, right out of high school. And uh, that didn't last very long because, as much as I liked designing these structures and buildings, everything that uh, I made, remember I said I didn't like math, um, everything that I made wasn't physically possible. <laughs> so at that point I, I kind of had to, I had to reset and um, I uh, spent, I mean, really just spent a few years finding myself. I dropped out of school um, and I got a job working at a restaurant. I was a bartender, um, made pretty good money for like somebody in their late teens, early twenties doing that. Um, and I spent that money on, uh, video games. I started going out. Actually, remember I said my parents didn't buy me a console. Um, I bought my first console, I think when I was like maybe 14 or 15, I think it was the, 
Sega Master System. Okay. Um, and then I had the Super Nite- or the Nintendo after that. Um, but as I was was after I dropped out of school and I'm finding myself having all this extra cash from tips and stuff. That's basically what I did is I went to work at night and I, and um, I got home late and I played video games and then I went to bed late and I got up in the morning and played video games and then I went into work again and uh, did that for a few years and and uh, remember the uh, magazine Next Generation? Yeah. They used to advertise for art schools and there was a school called uh, Art Institute of Pittsburgh and I saw that I saw the article in there. I liked the fact that that magazine kind of had um, more of kind of professional edge to it. And um, it felt like something legit, like, you know, like I'd been kind of searching for these types of like articles um, that were kind of telling you about how games were made. Um, And even though it always seemed to me like fantasy land, like I lived in the in the middle of Michigan and uh you know, maybe they're out doing this someplace in the North Pole or something like that. I mean, it's like there's some wizards someplace, people like yourself that are making these uh, video games. I knew California was um, in Texas, I think, like like the uh, Austin area were kind of hotbeds. Yeah. And um, what the hell? I'll, I'll go to school. I like art. I'll see how if I can actually take some of these designs that never worked in, in reality in college on paper and see if I can build them in 3D and uh see where that goes and i mean that's 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 kind of where it started and uh where it ended for my pre uh professional career so what was the first 3d program you were using in college um the first 3d program was 3d studio max i think it was r3 or r4 okay so you still use it max no i don't i i you know for so many years i was one of these people that uh when I came out, of, when I came out of college, uh, we had a choice. You could use Max, you could use Maya. Mm-hmm. And I saw within, and this was at Atari. My first job was uh, Atari up in Milpitas, um, and uh, that's because the the exporter to our game supported that. And I started seeing some of the features that I, I wanted to use. Um, the coders weren't supporting Max for whatever reason, so I slowly had to uh, start converting over to Maya, and. Um, for years, I, I was kind of fighting against that, even though after a while, I found myself changing my hotkey structure that was much more elegant in Maya to working that way in Max. And then at that point, I was like, why am I even using Max anymore? That stack is hard to get away from, though. It I is. Really, it is. That's the one thing. I forgot about I, the stack. That's a long time ago. <laughs> I miss I miss that. I, I mean, I for fun, I do three modeling all the time. And, sure. And Maya is what I use because we use it here. But I used Max for a long time, and I think for whatever reason, it just never seemed to work the same in yeah. Maya. You yeah, think, they, right? They get this, they, well, yeah, I mean, since, a lot of things like both. Booleans didn't work as well in Maya as they did in Max. Max had some better uh, modeling tools, especially if you came from more of like a lightweight background. Um, but yeah, the stack was was like this non-destructive way that you could work and you could experiment and you could always go back. And it was like... It it felt like uh, it was taking some of the best parts of like the layering system in Photoshop and improving upon it. Yeah, totally. Oh, well, we could talk about art tools all day because I think they're really cool. But I haven't done art in a long time, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was your, you know, what what about being an artist and eventually getting into games? Um, how, how did that process go from from being in college to being an art director at a game studio. How would you describe that journey? Um, well, I think that the school that I went to didn't try to pre- predefine or pigeonhole any of the students. In fact, the school didn't give us a whole lot of direction. Okay. So they gave us the tools. Really, we, we had SGIs there and we had Macs and we had whatever the cutting edge uh, Macintosh machines were at that at that point. Um, and in a lot of ways, you could argue that some of the students were better than the professors at, at that, like actually learning the craft because we didn't have families and we didn't have, you know, to worry about a lot of the things that like adults, older adults have to worry about. And um, and we were in it for at least I was in it because I was deeply passionate about it. It wasn't about it was about learning it and and feeding my brain. And it wasn't so much about uh, making money that would come down the low down the road as long as I graduated and that was always the end goal it's like 
I want to do something that, I mean, one of the things I've learned from all the other jobs I had, I mean, I worked in, a, while I was going to school, I worked at a Babbage as a video game store and I really liked that. Um, but I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I, I wanted to do something that creatively um, inspired me to the point that it's really simple. When I leave it, uh, work from home to go home, I want to come back to work the next day. Yeah. I don't want to start worrying about, because that's the way it used to work. Oh, you know, crap. I got to come back into work the next day unless I had a day off or something like that. And I wanted to start thinking about things in a lot more long term. So I found myself doing that in college. It's like, all right, there's this thing that I'm building that there's, and that's another thing that I liked about school. There wasn't a lot of like um, expectations of what you did. Mm. Um, so I could, fashion a lot of the things that I was building towards games. And, uh, um, you know, I would think about things not in terms of like, yeah, this, this task is going to take me a couple of days. I started thinking it's like, this is going to take me weeks, if not months. Um, it could take me an entire semester. And that's something that I learned and, 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 and had the discipline to get through school and, and, and I did well for my class. Um, my goal always being to come out to California and, and, um, at the time, it didn't make a difference whether it was Northern California or Southern California. They all seemed the same to me. Found out that they're very <laughs> different after yeah. I lived here for several years. But um, I, I learned this kind of like uh, real genuine um, work ethic that wasn't – I learned that from the other types of jobs that I had too. But it's because I had this perspective. It's like I can be doing kind of this crap that I don't like to do, even though I take a lot of pride in it and I try to be the best I want, I want to be. And when I was at Babbage's, I was a manager. Um, I, you know, wanted to take that that ethic and apply it to something that, like, I'm super passionate about. And um, from my first day at Atari, I got I got a, uh, uh, hired as an environment artist, a junior environment artist. And I was just got in it. 10, which I thought was great. You don't have to get to work until 10, but I was there until like 10, 11 o'clock at night, found myself there until midnight. And it was just because, Hey, I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't know anybody in California and you know what? I didn't care. I was meeting people while I was doing what I love to do. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, how do you go from there to becoming an art director? Um, well, I think that, uh, environment art was a really good place for me to start. And that kind of goes back to what I was talking about at schools. I, I wasn't pigeonholed. They didn't say work on characters or animation or anything. I kind of worked on everything because I wanted to learn as much as I could. And in environment art, I found that I got to do not only like, you know, the layout and like the, the look of the level, but I got to animate the things inside the level. I got to rig the things inside the level and I got to light everything in there and it's, and, and work on optimizing it and streaming and, um, just a ton of ownership over a lot of different parts of the game. I mean, and teams were small enough back then. We might, first game I worked on, I think we had like 10 or 12 people on it or something like that. So if I wanted a bird flying around in my level, I didn't, the animator wasn't going to have time to to model and rig that bird. I had to create it myself and I had to come up with clever ways to do it that was performant. Um, and that's, you know, I'm working with coders. I'm working with the, with the uh, designers. I'm working with... Um, the, the, the sound team working with all these different groups because I was an environment art. And I'm also like back then we were small enough that I was doing the, the level design, the layout of all the levels. I'd get a, a sheet of paper from the art director and it's like, this is what it's got to look like. And it was like a 3d isometric. Um, and I'd have a pretty good idea of what the spirit of it was, but then I had to sit down and apply, um, you know, how, what are the actual footsteps and what's the traversal and those types of things. So I got a very well-rounded kind of experience. And, um, that just served me like, I, you know, it, it taught me to like be proactive and go and talk to people and learn about the things that I don't know about so I can get them done myself or work with others to make sure that that stuff gets put to the level of quality that I expect for all the effort that I'm giving it yeah. as well too. And, um, just, you know, ended up becoming going from junior environment artist to environment artist up to lead environment artist. I'm now establishing kind of the look of the game. Um, I, uh, uh, was went when I went to Sony to work on God of War one, um, they, they brought me in at, they didn't say I was lead environment artist, Um, but they ended up making me one pretty soon along with like Ken Feldman, who I work with right now, who's one of the art directors of my current game. And, uh, 
a friend of mine, Gustavo Rashi, we were all kind of like a three headed, um, uh, lead environment team. Okay. Um, and after that project was over, I was asked, uh, but you know, Shannon studs still, mm -hmm. um, if I wanted to be art director on God of War two and went from, you know, more kind of leading by example and not having any direct reports when I was an environment art lead and just kind of like, but working and facilitating with people to make sure that things were good to now. I think I have like 50 direct reports, um, because that must've been a shock. Yeah, it was. And it was, it was going from, it wasn't back then. It wasn't just the environment art team and or the concept. It actually, the concept team did not report to me on that game. Um, but it was environment art, it was character art, it was animation. Um, and that was by the end of that project, it was close to 50 people. So I was doing reviews all the time, like things that, um, you know, aren't the sexiest part of work, but, um, the, the, I still took those very seriously because it was, it was, it was all be about being measured. It's like, we're going to do this right. We're going to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Did you at that point walk away from creating art? No, I probably should have. Um, I uh, got myself on God of War 2. We had a very tight schedule. We had to get a, a uh, last cycle PlayStation 2 game out in two years. And um, one of the levels, I mean, actually, I did this on God of War 1 as well, too, is I picked up a level on God of War 1 that everybody ended up hammering, which was the Hades level. I don't know if you remember that one, if you yeah. played it. Um, and I will always say, well, the, the game's better for having it than not having it at all. Even if it was painful, it's Hades. It's hell. It's supposed to it's supposed to be it's supposed to hurt um but that was a really tight deadline and i didn't want to lo lose it and i talked to jaffe and and and, and we're like we're going to do this um and i ended up it, it made me have to work a ton of overtime um and i ended up doing the same thing in god of war 2 as art director i i was doing a lot of art to kind of illustrate to people my ideas of how they might be able to solve problems and mm -hmm. things like that but then i ended up taking on a big level the atlas level where um, you end up getting the Icarus wings. And that was just, again, I'm trying to juggle all this stuff and I'm, I've got this massive level at the same time. I did it again on God of War 3. Um, I uh, wasn't happy with some of the play tests that we were getting back um, of how we were ending the game. And I didn't think, I felt like, well, yeah, we've got some boss battles, but there isn't any really soul or spirit to the game. There's nothing about it that like I think that really means anything to really Kratos or anything deeper than just going and killing people. Um, so we ended up doing, I came up with the idea for the dream sequence at the end of the game, um, knowing that nobody had the time to do it. And, but I ended up uh, teaming up with my uh, the lead designer um, or design director in the game, Todd Pappy, who's a good friend of mine. And uh, we uh, tag teamed it. We got help from lead anime, lead animator, Bruno on it. And, um, again, it was a lot of late nights coming up with a unique visual style for that. Um, that spoke to like, you know, this is a kind of a dream sequence, but sequence, but also fits with the rest of the game. We ended up choosing the same style that we used in flashbacks and very stylized and, and, um, our UI. And we had to figure out a way to, um, engineer that into the game engine. Because all that stuff was like either pre-rendered or it was 2D sprites. And um, yeah, I want another another project. We're working super late, driving home, 2 o'clock in, in the morning, yelling at myself. Well, how did I get myself into this nonsense again? Um, haven't done that since. Oh, that's cool. That's great. <laughs> do you, when you are giving advice to people who are on your team, do you use those as examples? I think people have heard those stories. Um I need to be careful because I get into this trap where I'll tend to say, well, on this game, I did this and on this game, I did that. So I try to, I'm sure people have heard those stories, but I try to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get that out of my, my, um, tool set right now. Makes sense. I mean, I, I bring that up because we tend to discuss the, the idea of a working lead pretty frequently. Yeah. Somebody who has management and production responsibilities and how challenging that is to balance those things. Yep. It sounds like you were going through that in sort of a very, uh, a uh, big way on the God of war games. Yeah. I mean, I, I did learn that there's only so much that I can do and that, um, and I learned this all, even when I was back at Atari is it's, you're going to be much more, the end result is going to be much better for everybody. If you share 
the burden. Right. And, um, and that's comes down to delegating and, uh, you know, for me, I learned as an art director with, like I said, going from no reports to 50, it's like, I can have a much greater influence on the team if I'm meeting with people and talking with them, because once they feel like they're siloed and, and people feel like they're, that, that there's, there's no communication happening and that they might feel like you're not interest, interested. So that I was very careful um, when I chose to take on that extra work, I was doing it after a certain hour, like I'd do it at like nine o'clock at night or something like that. Like, um, and it was because there was no other option. Mm. Like if we'd exhausted any other um, options and it's like, look, this is, these will be kind of make, make or break moments for the game. But since then, um, teams have gotten a lot bigger, um, and uh, especially now here at, at Respawn, um, building a new team, not having an identity, you know, building it from scratch and not, I mean, maybe we're starting to build one now, an identity, because we've finished this game. We can look back and point at processes, what worked and what didn't, and start making real processes out of them rather than like, um, you know, flying the plane and trying to put it together at the exact same time um, and land it. Um, it's, it's, uh, there is no, for me, there is no other option, but to just work directly with people and use my communication s skills and, um, um, and, uh, allow people to, you know, own things, mm -hmm. um, and not myself. I mean, I, I guess at the end of the day, the way I look at it is I will, I own the responsibility of our failure but the team owns the responsibility of our success. Um, I think so, that's a great statement for any leader, right? That's ultimately what leaders should be thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of leadership positions, your game director on Jedi Fallen Order, what is the difference for you between uh, a game director and a creative director? It's a good question. Um, I, you know, at Respawn, game director is pretty much um, Vince allows us to kind of define those as we want. Okay. Um, I know that when I was at Sony at one point, I was a game director and then they changed that title to creative director. And then they said, what do you want to be a game director or creative director? And I didn't really, it didn't really matter to me. I just, what mattered is, well, what's, what's my role? What's my responsibility? And at Sony, it was, um, I was asked to, uh, worry about, I think at the time it was like, what is little Timmy in Iowa think about the game. Um, and that's all you should be concerned about. And whatever it takes to make sure that, you know, there's a smile on, on the end user's uh, face when they're playing the game. And I had a, I really struggled with that. And I think that um, I, I, they didn't want me to worry about finances. They didn't want me to worry about personnel and crunch and all that kind of stuff. Um, at least that's the way it was framed to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just, I, that's not like kind of in my, in my uh, DNA. Um, so I would be, I would be concerned about, you know, uh, individual members on the team and um, tried to strive to like keep in touch with day to day what, how think people were affected by everything and the impact of the decisions that I was making. So I always took that into account. And that hasn't changed. I still do that here. I remember before coming to respond, Vince and I having a conversation about the possibility. And I said, well, what's your definition of a game director? And he said, well, it's the same thing as a movie, movie director. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I find interesting is that like for, for this game, it was I started this team um, as the first per member on the team and got to like be involved with with all the hires and and things like headcount and and budgeting and things that I was asked not I wasn't asked to worry about Sony I got to learn about um, and I found that fascinating um, and I think that I'll make better decisions I'm making better decisions now than I would have made then because there really is I think there is a value to um, in a very very like human and and, um, and mature way thinking about all the realities. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, you could make the best game in the world, but if it costs, you know, a certain amount and it, and it has this result on the team, um, was it worth it? 
And uh, that's one of the, yeah, like, like I said, that's been one of the most interesting parts of the job here at Respawn is just that I've been, this is, this goes through also the, you know, EA buying the company and seeing how the EA structure works and everything and, and just learning new, new stuff all the time. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to come to Respawn and, and embrace is after being at Sony for 11 years, I think, um, I saw one very successful way of making a game and I wanted to have the opportunity to work with some other people that made very different games and see how they did it. Mm -hmm. And um, ultimately, hopefully, um, I've gotten a little bit better for it. Well, I'm sure you brought some ph uh, philosophies over with you. And I, I kind of want to talk about the, your approach more specifically sure. as a creative leader. Uh, what would you say the definition of creative leadership is for you? Like, I think mean, I'll go back to what I said before. It's like basically... I find myself, it's all, for me, it's all about ownership. Okay. Um, I should, um, you know, basically define what the guiding light is, but sometimes that doesn't mean it needs to be more than a paragraph or a page for everybody to kind of understand it and then take it and then they can evolve it into something that belongs to all of us. Okay. So it's not just mine. I'm not an auteur. Like I said, I, I really firmly believe in if we fail, it's, it's, you can throw it on me. But if we su succeed, it's the team. We did it together. I think that's fantastic. But there must be times when you've got a difficult decision to make or you've got the team that's a, team members that are pushing against, say, an idea that you believe in. So how do you get people on board with some of the more challenging concepts? What's your, what's your tech, what are your techniques? Um, I don't... I don't really hold anything really sacred. I think some one of the problems that that uh, leaders can get into is that they have a certain vision or thought of of how something should um, come to life, and they don't budge on that. And it's got to be my way or the highway. And the reality is, if other people they get it and they kind of understand the spirit of what it is, and they take it someplace else. I'm okay with that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's about as a leader being flexible and not putting myself or the team in situations where we have to have those confrontations that oftentimes aren't even necessary. Um, it's it's swallowing your pride. Um, people more often than not have better ideas than I do, um, but uh, um, and I don't. And if somebody comes up with something better, or if it's not if it's not mine, then then I've over time learned to live with that. Um, it's not always easy. Sometimes, I mean, I, I have to make sure that I have enough skin in the game that I do care about it and that it doesn't get to the point where it's just kind of like, um, it's a machine that's kind of moving forward and, and, um, I, I'm not even doing any course correcting here and there. Uh, I don't, I don't want it to get to into a situation where it feels like I'm kind of going through the motion. So I have to make sure that there's things that I'm kind of putting down that I want done a certain way, but then it just comes down to like selling people on the ideas and, and how different uh, creators and leaders do that. It's their own technique. And I don't really know that I have any kind of secret sauce other than I listen to others and I respect their opinions. And, and um, um, I hope, I hope, and I, I believe that the people that I work, work with know that I'm genuine about that. Mm -hmm. I've heard they do. <laughs> That's, That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of folks who know you and they speak very highly of you. Um, but I'll bet you, uh, just to ask another sort of hard question, do you run into situations where you are championing, championing an aspect of the game or somebody else is, and you've got team members who say, well, that doesn't sound like fun or I can't do that. Yeah. It happens all the time. So what is your approach? What is response approach to that? And, and what do you, have you, brought your own thoughts to respawn around that? Um, I mean, early on, I learned that response um, approach is everybody's got a voice, but not everybody can cast the final vote. Mm -hmm. And um, you just make sure that everybody can be he heard. Um, there's people, we do surveys all the time at work um, where people can give their, their feedback on it. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes that's harsh. Sometimes it's not very constructive. I found one thing that that helps that a little bit is if you no longer make them anonymous and people have to put their name um, where they're uh, where they're giving feedback. 
Um, how do you, you know what? I, I'm glad you brought that up because we struggle with anonymity as well. And I want to, what do you think of the thesis that if you don't make things anonymous, you will get a lot less feedback and a lot less useful feedback? Is that, do you think that's true? I think in today's day and age, maybe, I think in today's day and age where, um, everybody is kind of, um, able to have conversations wherever they want on Twitter or there's, there's, th those aren't anonymous. So I don't know why that sh people should be able to, um, you know, play by the same rules at work. Well, there is hierarchy at work and there is, it's a job. And so there's certainly, I, what I find sometimes is there's fear of retribution. If somebody says something that they believe will upset one of their, uh, a manager or somebody who's higher in the, in the chain of command. In that, in that situation, I think, and I think that's completely fair. I think people can always feel like that they can come and talk to me mm -hmm. or they can talk to other. We encourage people. It's like, look, if you're having a problem with like you're directly talk to somebody else, go to HR, yeah. that type of thing. But when it comes down to, Hey, um, I think we should have, uh, we should have a different timing window for a parry than we have right now on the game. That's, that's not something that's very objective. It's very subjective. And I'd rather hear, let's add a few more frames or, or cut a few more frames than somebody saying our timing window sucks. And I think when you, when you start to, when you ask people to kind of put their name to something, you, the feedback just gets a lot better. Yeah. Um, and one way or another, I mean, uh, people's ideas will, will, will get heard. I think, um, we'd started doing, a. Um, and we got to, we got to get back to this. We've been doing, since I started there, we did every Friday, something called show and tell, which we started this when we had five people on the team. And that meant we just went out around to everybody's desk and it's like, Hey, what'd you work on today? And we, I think we were able to sustain that until like, maybe we had like 30 or 35 people. And it's just like, okay, it was fun when it was an hour and we were five people because we're just really hashing out like how we're making the game. But now that we have 30 people. It's not an hour anymore. Sometimes it was like two, two and a half hours and there wasn't enough time for everybody to talk about it. Um, but it was still great because everybody got to see it's, it was, a, it's an awesome tool for communication because everybody got to see what everybody else was working on. Yeah. And even when we got to our maximum size, then we would all go in a big room and every Friday, you know, we'd have these giants, I think they're like 85 inch TVs or something like that, dual TVs and everybody could see. Only if you wanted to show something. That was always the rule. Right. Hey, if you don't feel like showing anything, no pressure. And uh, it was still great. Like, um, And towards the end, we started doing, and I only did a handful of these, and I feel bad that um, we didn't do more, but we'll start it again, a Q&A where people could um, you know, submit a couple questions that they were aimed directly towards me. And I would read the question and give the best answer I could. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, this is all good kind of like normal, like um, course of development, development, not like alpha, beta, final. Like we stopped, sure. we stopped doing the show and tell then. But like as people start getting back from vacations and things like that, we'll start rolling back into in, um, some more of these types of uh, processes that we have. So since you're talking about the beginning of the project, right, this last project, did was there anything that you did to define the core elements of the game as early as possible? Yeah. Absolutely. So that was the, that was the number one oh, really? uh, okay. thing is that I had, uh, my last project I had worked on, um, we tried, we kind of took a horizontal approach where we figured out everything that we needed to make in the game. We started pushing forward with everything all at once. And that, I think that was kind of a byproduct of getting done with God of War three and feeling like we're like, you know, invincible to a certain extent, it's like, yeah, we got this, we can make whatever we want. And we, uh, lost sight of the things that were really important. And it's just like, what does it feel like to have a player on the screen and press the controller forward? How does that feel? How do you make that feel good? What is if, how does, how do you make that motion model, um, really feel something that you can connect to? And, um, if you can't do that, you really can't, but you can't build the fundamentals of, 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 design and the whole horizontal mo model kind of approach that we were taking kind of fell apart because we were chasing our tail on just like feel. And that was, 
part of the reason why is because that was a very large team and it was like we we uh had to we had to make everything all at once this we just had a few people mm -hmm. and we had this this luxury that nobody i don't think very very rarely gets in games where we had just shipped um titanfall one it was very successful um you know we start something new with with kind of that cushion this smaller team that's not under a whole bunch of pressure um we didn't i didn't have people you know banging down my door sending me emails like what do i do what do i do because all we were working on was like i said the motion model the fundamentals the pillars of the game there's um you know a handful of pillars and can you share those well at the time that was a different game oh, okay um and a lot of that um ended up becoming star wars but uh yeah it was what we call thoughtful combat thoughtful combat okay and um which is what you're like that's what we have in the game right now right and, you know, very active kind of agile kind of exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it wasn't a Jedi at that time, but um, but the 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 uh, underlying foundation of what we wanted to achieve um, and and motivate the player with is somewhat intact. Um, and then we wanted to have puzzles in the game, and um, you know, we. I mean, I think we at, there, at one point we were even we, yes, we were talking about a. Uh, we never got it stood up, but we were talking about like a little buddy, um, kind of partner AI as well too. So you get those things working. Um, we don't need to be re writing the script right now, right? You know, like that. And <laughs> all we needed was was I think I did like fifth no twelve different dozen different game concepts, and they were all two pages, and. When we decided the one that we were going to move forward with, that two pages became probably something like more like 20 or something like that. But it was giving more kind of just inspiration and spirit to what each one of those pillars was and ways that we could potentially go with them. Okay. But it was by no means a prescription. And it was something that a small team could could look at and they could, they could contribute to and together. And uh, we were able to find f fun pretty early. And again, that's just... That's just experience right there. How do you start a new game? Well, that's the that's the first thing you have to find. You you can write a story around anything. Yeah, a um, little bit different working on Star Wars. Once you start talking about story, that's that's it becomes there's that's more of kind of like um, from Lucasfilm's point of view, that is the most important thing. I mean, they want of course fun as well too, but you have to have fun and you have to it's it's it's. It's an expectation that the story is, is is really good and it's Star Wars. So we had to work on that in parallel. It's, but it sounds like you had the luxury of knowing what was going to be fun before you began discussing the Star Wars direction. We had something that was fun. Well, that's great. And um, it's I think that proves, proves something to us as a team, um, a small team. And, um, and uh, it, it also allowed us to grow. Um, because people could see, even when we were working on Star Wars, we could show them this old prototype that during interviews and whatnot, we could show this old prototype that we worked on. And people were like, wow, that's pretty impressive that this group was able to do that. I want to be part of that. And um, it also gave us a kind of a benchmark of, of where to start conversations and talking mm -hmm. and things like that. Because we had developed kind of a feel like, a, um, you know, very early on, it's got to, the games just has to feel like I mentioned before, connected to the player. Um, it, that that you know we, we're we're allowing the player to cancel a lot of animations, um, and it has more of a very ins like kind of like a classic Japanese inspired like uh, motion model, um, and that that's that kind of stuff is a lot easier to put in somebody's hands and let them play it and understand it than try to explain it. Yeah. Well, so what was the point where you guys announced to the team that you were going to be working on Star Wars? So that's a crazy story. Um, I'll have to take a couple steps back to um, kind of frame it properly. When I first came over to Respawn, Vince and I had been talking about for a while about starting a new team. And um, it was pretty clear that at that point that Titanfall was going to be a success was right, right around launch before that probably, but they could tell that the, the game was, it was gelling together and mm -hmm. it, was, it was really good momentum behind it. Um, and he brought up the idea of like, Hey, would you ever want to work on a star Wars game? 
And yeah, of course, I'd love to work on a Star Wars game. And and um, we continue chatting and having conversations. When I actually when I uh, when I did move over, um, that that was the plan. Was like, well, let's. Well, I mean, even before, like we we had had discussions. Like, let's see if we can. You know, we have a good relationship with EA. Let's see if this is something that they're interested in. And if not, then we could plan B is we'll just start a new IP. And uh, day one, I started, I, even before I started, I started coming up. I, uh, before I was in the building, I started coming up with ideas of what that could be. And like within a, a week or two weeks or something like that, um, we had a one pager or two pager or something. And we t- discussed it with EA and and it just, at that time, it, what, it, 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 the stars weren't aligned on it. So we went to plan B um, and that's when we started building up the team a little bit at the same time. And um, we, uh, you know, Ken Feldman and came over as, as he's former art director that I worked with, I mentioned before um, and Jeff majors and Jason D Harris um, designers that I'd worked with before uh, Fabrice was a coder that I worked with before. Mm-hmm. Um, we picked up Jay up and Hano, who were character artists. Bruce, who was part of the Titanfall team, wanted to jump on board with us, like after hours, and and help us with the animations. And um, we we built this demo that was really cool, very different game. But I got to say, there was things in there that, like, definitely. I mean, Star Wars kind of influences everything to a certain extent. <laughs> it's when you're making video games, anyway. I mean, I can't. I don't think I've worked on a game that didn't have some Star Wars. Uh, influence in it and um i think that we, we started showing this game to, to other publishers and we um got a really really good reaction and yay was one of them and i think they could see how that this this could be like hey there's something here like and this team did it and um this might be able to we might be able to turn this into like a, a star wars thing and they came i got called into uh I was at the gym one day and, and Vince called me up and said, I need you to meet me at the office right now. And, and uh, he's like, we got this, this um, opportunity here. Um, EA is really excited about this game and they're, they're going to, they're going to make us an offer, but they're wondering if we want to do Star Wars first. And, uh, but that was kind of contingent on it. It's like, we really want you guys to do Star Wars and, and I need you to make a decision in the next half hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, wait a minute, I've been working on this other thing for the last year. More importantly, my whole team's been working on this this other thing for the last year. The magic rests with them. Yeah. It's not my, just my decision. And I told him, we just sat in a room for a half hour, went back and forth. I said, let's do Star Wars. And I uh, went back to my office and I couldn't think. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, just was completely complete vegetable um and just got in my car and i drove home i'm like i can't deal with this anymore and um vince the next day had a big meeting with with uh ea and uh i ended up texting him like i don't think we should do this like i'm like (laughs) this is like i've just made a decision like everybody might up and quit like and then we have nothing you know what i mean like there's 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 nothing without a team right and um, we decided the best thing to do was to, to, um, kind of put the brakes on a little bit. Um, EA wanted to, to close the deal, but we, we brought it to the team the next day and explained to them the situation. It's like, look, we can go one way or the other because we had an offer from another developer to, to or publisher to do the other game. Yeah. And, um, and it's like, we're leaving, you know, this is up to the team, you know, thumbs up or if you want to do it, um, let's let's like people are interested in doing star wars thumbs up thumbs up if you're interested in doing the other thing and when we said far, star wars every single person put their thumb up <laughs> and some people put two thumbs up okay and i think it was the same thing that i was feeling and the same thing that vince vince was feeling it's just like look when are we ever going to get this opportunity again i mean like at, to make a star wars game um and to be able to to do it when there's kind of like a resurgence um with the whole franchise and be a part of that i don't think that's likely to happen again and um um yeah we can't we couldn't pass up that chance that's great 
actually, I had a very similar experience when we made the call to work on Spider-Man. Okay. I was really worried about what the team would think. And my assumption was that most people would not necessarily be on board. But when I asked everybody, it was the same thing. Double thumbs up. Right. Why wouldn't we work on a Marvel game, right? Or Spider-Man. And Spider-Man actually wasn't uh, the initial idea. It was, should we work on a Marvel game? And I was really overthinking it. And it was you know, when the teams had that reaction, it just made all the difference. That's so awesome. I, I know what it's you went through. I mean, very that's similar. A, it's tough, right? When you're When you are responsible for that big decision that's going to potentially change the course of a company. Yeah. Right. But ultimately to your point, the team has the answer. Yep. Yeah. That's great. That's a great story. Well, I'm, I'm sure that as you moved into star Wars, there were a lot of really tough design decisions and having played, I think about 14 hours of it now, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about what you must've gone through and I'll ask an obvious one. When was the blasters versus lightsabers argument? Was that there, was, there was really never a, a discussion about that. My background is like melee fo focused okay. action. And um, did anybody ever bring it up and go, well, Stig, we should definitely. Well, yeah, blasters. actually, the, that was brought up by Lucasfilm right off the bat. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I went out there. We had been on the game, you know, unofficially for months before we got to like I got my first visit up to the Presidio. Um, to their their head headquarters, and I met with them, and they they weren't super comfortable with the idea. Like I, I pitched, hey, what if we do a game about you know Jedi and Force powers? And they were not super comfortable with that. And um, they they kind of threw it back, and it's like, what about you know blasters and you know maybe you know bounty hunters or? Uh, and I was like, you know, that's not the background of the team that we built. That's not. I mean, you're. You might as well ask me to and us to start building a racing game at this point. That's that. That's not. You. I don't think anybody's going to be really happy with the results of that. Yeah. But they. What I came to learn and find out is that um, for them, um, you know, the the Jedi um, is the holy grail, and to make a game about Jedi, you got to earn it. And there was a little bit of a back and forth, but they could see where I was coming from. And um, he said, all right, we can start having a conversation about making a game about force users. But not, not, not Jedi. Say Jedi. Oh, that's not Jedi. Okay. And then the game comes out. Its name is Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> so there, was a, there obviously was like a big, um, you know, relationship that needed to be built there. I'm sure you guys experienced similar things working with Spider-Man and Marvel um, it's all about trust. It's all about yep. us becoming students of the, you, you can think you know as much about Star Wars, but what I ended up learning is I didn't know anything. Well, yeah, I have another question about that. I, again, I was thinking as I was playing through, how did you catch up on the lore? Of course, you can go through the films. I mean, everybody stopped what they were doing and watched all the films over again, number of times, watched the animated series. Um, and uh, then it's just, it's, it's just about, having conversations a lot of times we needed to do things that there wasn't precedence for or, or in star wars or if there was we had to we had to come at it from a different angle mm -hmm. um so then it was more kind of like in a vacuum just talking about well this is the the thing that we need this and this is how it needs to function how do we get there together and then we just have a conversation about that so they've got a story team over there um they've got a production team over there and um, we uh, would openly have conversations. And at first they were very formal um, because we were trying to get to know each other. But then it got to the point where it's like, um, and they, they got an art team over there too, that where it's like, I'm just got these people on my uh, text messages and we're just having conversations at, you know, in the middle of the night about stuff. And that that's, that's how um, relationships grow and trust grows. And that's great. Well, so you, you mentioned the art team. Did you have, were, was, were the Lucasfilm artists or your artists coming up with brand new characters? And I ask this because I'm not as even close to as much of an expert as you are on Star yeah. Wars. And I when I play the game and I see a, a pretty wide range of enemies, I, I doubted that they are actually part of the Star Wars universe. Or is the universe actually that broad? A lot of the en uh, enemies um, were uh, 
I mean, of course, the whole basically the whole main cast is new characters that we created just for this story. Right. Um, the you know we, there is a rule that we couldn't break that uh, you know each planet needs to have its own biome and its own flora and fauna. So we had to create specific creatures for those planets. So if the planet is like some of the early ones like Bagano or Zepho that don't exist in Star Wars lore, then we have a lot of free, we had a lot of freedom um, based off our types that we need for the game to create what those are. So those are brand new concepts and um, brand new personalities that are now part of Star Wars. And that's cool because it's somewhat easier because we can create something that checks off all the boxes that we need under the hood to make something that's fun. Um, but it's harder because you have to build that that planet and you have to you, you have to figure out what the f- food chain is on it and what all the history is of that planet. But like a planet like a Sheik, um, which I'm 14 hours in, I'm sure you've explored. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that's already there. We knew what a Kashyyyk looked like. Um, and we some of the creatures that you find in Kashyyyk, of course, the Wookiees have been established. Yeah. Um, and some of the other ones were uh, uh, creatures that were in like card games from two decades old. Or, like we'd find s- stuff from different places that yeah. were um, part of like, I guess you would call the expanded universe okay. as inspiration. And sometimes like the white shock is a big spider that you've yeah. but now the white shock is now back into like main lore now. Oh really? We, so, you, so you guys have brought it back to the Star yeah. Wars? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know where I would find it in the main lore. Are you talking about in like, I, I, th- I could be wrong, but I think, I think the Y shock was in an old card game. Okay, but, I, but the, the name sounded familiar to me, but I not again. I it's a cool name. It's hard. One of those hard things that once you hear it, you think it's hard to forget. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you think that were there any brand new outside of the NPCs? Any brand new creatures that you guys created, or were they all derived derived or taken from existing expanded universe characters? So, like uh, a lot of the ones since Zepho didn't exist. All oh, right. So, Bagano didn't of, exist. All everything cute, that you find in there. Got it. So the exploding spore things, those yes. are, so we may see those in a Star Wars movie at some point, maybe. Potentially. That would be I, great. Yeah. That, that would, what a wonderful opportunity that would be to have a, have a very successful game, uh, essentially change the most successful movie franchise of all time. Right? That's, so, that's kind of the big prize. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's super cool. Um, did, so one other, one other thing I have to ask about is stealth. And, sure. and as I actually expected there to be stealth in, I don't know why I had that expectation, but it felt like a lot of the setups were, were meant for me to sort of sneak up and at least survey the surroundings before I charged in with my lightsaber and, and force moves. What did you guys go through various experiments on how to, whether you wanted to go deep on stealth? Not really. I think your um, observation is spot on. Uh, there's, there's, there's definitely. We want the player. We we give them like almost like perches to stand on yeah. before they jump into battle, to kind of survey the area. And this goes back to our whole thoughtful combat um, kind of touchstone. Uh, is that if you go, if you you probably notice if you just jump into those, unless you're playing on the extremely easy mode of the game, a lot of times you'll end up getting your butt kicked. I had to drop my difficulty because that tended to be what I did. Yeah. At least for the first uh, first half of my playtime so far. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, so are you playing on story now? Story no, 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 now? no. I'm playing. I started on uh, the Jedi Master. Okay. And I've dropped down to Jedi, Jedi Knight. Okay. So you bumped it up to Jedi Master when yeah. you started the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, we, when we built the stakes of the game and we be, built the stakes of the story, you know, there's this, you play as this unfinished Padawan that's um, being hunted down with extreme prejudice on these really terrifying and 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 um, just unsafe planets. Um, and they're... Baked into that, there really was. There's no reason to have stealth because you're always under attack. Okay. Um, so the yeah, the closest thing that 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 we had to that was um, is giving the player like having like our fights kind of like um, 
very handcrafted and precision paced and giving the player the like the, the those observation points where they could like kind of um choose before they jumped in yeah. how they wanted to do things i mean the other thing is like you can run away as well if you want to run past the enemies but then down the road you're going to end up paying for it because you're not going to be as powerful when you need to take on like really um tough tough baddies yeah and i i have become sort of addicted to your skill tree and and upgrade because i feel like you guys have done a great job of presenting enemies that are challenging especially you. if you're moving up on the difficulty uh levels and you i want every single one of those skills that you can earn and i in a lot of games i don't feel that way that's it's great <laughs> it's music to my ear yeah i mean that's that's great design it's something that um i think most of us as, aspire to when we're making games that have that kind of progression yeah it was tr it, for us it was a little tricky because we knew that um the game was about growth um and, and and finding your way um and we were we were afraid that we might get into a situation where if we cut off the hero too much then he doesn't seem very interesting from a gameplay standpoint early on um so there was a lot of debate back and forth of like when should we lock, start unlocking the skill tree um and really letting the player mm. experience that power fantasy of being a jedi and um and a lot of that will also fact was factored into that is when you're learning like your new major powers um i mean if i had to do it over again there was a couple tweaks that i would do there to to bring the power curve in a little bit earlier in the game mm -hmm. but um i think w once people have ac expectations and they go out into the game and they know that it's like look, you're not like this all powerful, mighty Jedi. That's not what the game's about when it starts. Then they can appreciate it over time. So it sounds like that's what's happening to you with the, the skill tree um, right now. And and again, um, that's that's exactly what I wanted to hear. It is. And, and it's part of the other thing that I think you did, you guys did a great job on is not introducing overly complex mechanics too early in the skill tree. Yeah. So that it gives players a chance to get really comfortable with the core moves before you start having to use different buttons in your combos. Yeah. Right. That was such a help uh, for, for me I mean, as maybe not such a great game player. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's heartening to see like my, I've got twins that are 11 years old and like that they can just pick up the game. And I'm not saying you should have 11 year olds playing this game. It's teen rated, but, <laughs> but uh, Oh my gosh, that's funny. Um, I believe in the ESRB rating system. I've I caught do. them a couple times playing the game when I asked them not to. And uh, it's uh, to see that we were able to make something that I think that like younger people can play and really enjoy and master mm -hmm. but also it's it's still a challenge to like a, a very wide net what very wide audience of adults to even up to hardcore and I, I think that like the fact that you can change your skill level anytime throughout the game really helps with that that's 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 some i think that's a a great accomplishment because that's a, what star wars is all about yeah. right star wars is about like making something that appeals to a a mass audience that's can be casual, but then also can be really nerdy and hardcore. Yeah. That's a great, I didn't realize also, that. It, it transcends ages yeah. as well. True. True. Uh, well, speaking of seeing different types of uh, different ages, different skill levels play, did anything that reviewers said or players that posted online surprise you? Um, man, I got to think about that. I think I, went in with a pretty good idea. We did a lot of uh, focus testing on this game. Mm. And um, a lot of the the positive responses and a lot of the criticisms are things that like we were expecting. Okay. Um, so big surprise. No, I wouldn't say that there's anything that was a big surprise. And I'm not trying to say that like in a it's in a in like any type of uh all knowing or arrogant way or anything. It was well, I think that your point about focus testing is is spot on. When you do enough fo focus testing and you do it consistently throughout the project, there shouldn't be anything that surprises you, right? There's that, and it's also Star Wars. I think, and um, I should say forces, usability testing. Sorry, not focus testing. Yeah, Star Wars um, 
what I, what I learned on it is, is like I said, very early on, you might think, you know, everything, you know, nothing. And that, that has to do with making the game as well. And after our first press event, um, where we, we kind of announced the game, my eyes were wide open at that point, And I learned to expect anything. So I think part of the reason why that when I read things, I wasn't surprised one way or the other is because I was conditioned over months and months and months of making this game and reading forums and, and uh, reading articles and reading feedback and also all of our uh, uh, user research. Yeah. Well, I guess that's that makes sense. And it's such a that game has such a blast radius, right? Because people care so deeply about Star Wars that they're going to be giving you a lot of things that you probably can't respond to, right? Yep. Uh, until the game's out. Yep. So you're getting all that. So yeah, it makes sense that you would be very well prepared. Yeah. I mean, when the dust settles, like we're, we're looking at, I mean, we have millions of people that can give us feedback now yeah. and, and there's, there's, um, that's incredibly valuable and, um, it validated a lot of things and, and confirmed it validated and confirmed a lot of things that, okay, you're doing this right. You need to fix these things. Yeah. And you couldn't hope to have better information than that because it gives us a, a clear kind of direction and how we have to move forward on things. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, I want to go back to Lucasfilm for just a minute okay. uh, because you mentioned that you develop trust throughout the relationship. So were there ever times where you guys had vehement disagreements over things? Of course. I mean, it, there's, I would say most of the dis disagreements we had were more early on. And that was just kind of like trying, like I said, trying to earn trust and trying to learn each other. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, it was never, I think on their end, I can kind of see the perspective better than ours because they, they own the license and yeah. they, they, um, it's their responsibility that that we stay in line with what and play by the rules, and um, I think the disagreements were more. Maybe it's not that they weren't open disagreements that we had. I mean, maybe there's a handful of those, but like there was more on on our side at work. I might be like, yeah, I spoke with Lucasfilm and they gave us a hard no on this one thing. Why? Why can't we do this? And it's sometimes we didn't get a very good explanation, and that's because. They couldn't tell us why, which is a very fair response when you're working with such a big franchise. Because they're doing a lot of other things that they can't necessarily talk about, right? Yeah, there could be a lot of different reasons. Yeah. And um, I I think it was just more for us. To, it, what we needed to learn is to be flexible mm -hmm. and um, kind of take a step back from being like the coming from the game design uh, thought where – Hey, you can just come up with a bunch of cool ideas and, and as long as it sounds cool, it's going to work. Um, and accepting that like, no, we don't own this. And, um, like I said, we got to play by the rules and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was a great, great learning, ex learning process. I've never done anything like it before in my life. I mean, the closest thing, um, was when I was working on the God of War uh, games. I was for a while, I was the franchise director and that meant, you know, ready at dawn was working on games with us and we had to review all that and we had to give them feedback to make sure, um, you know, the, the, the it was falling within, you know, the, the, uh, standard of what we, um, thought of the game and, you know, whether, or companies are making action figures or comic books or novels, it's all, it's the same thing. It's on a very, very different scale. And, um, I think that did help me a little bit. Um, yeah, it gives you that perspective that very few people have. I mean, that's that's what a great experience to yeah. bring to this project. Makes sense. So I I wanted to just ask one more question about the game itself. Sure. And and that is single player uh, only versus adding multiplayer in. And I I bring this up because we're we make games that are primarily single player, yep. and it seems like there has been. Uh, a trend uh, over the last few years to have marquee titles not include a multiplayer mode. And uh, why do you think that that ha a trend has been occurring? And I maybe I'm wrong about this, but this is just my sort of uh, naive observation. I mean, you know, I can't speak for 
any of the other titles out there in, in, in regards to the trend. I, I acknowledge and I recognize you're 100% right. It's something that's there. There's there's people that want to play single player games. I think if I had to like step back, we've seen the market grow in the last more than the last decade in a lot of other areas. And um, that doesn't mean the single players went away. Right. Well, yeah, clearly they didn't. And and so you make the game for them and 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 that type of player. And obviously they're still there. They're very hungry. They want to play games like this. And um, and my team wanted to make a single player game. And that's what we're good at. Well, certainly what's happened, too, is, and I think Jedi is an excellent example of this, is these games have become so rich in terms of story and experience and just breadth that it provides the kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it a time sink necessarily, but it's the, the, the escape that, you know, we couldn't, we, we couldn't get a decade ago with most single player games. Like we felt like we had to add multiplayer yeah. to extend the experience to the point where people felt like they were getting what they paid for. Yeah. Yeah. It's they're, they're beyond a rental yeah. now. And, um, I mean, that's not really a thing anymore, but I mean, it <laughs> will be in other ways, but, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's more than that. And I think that, um, I think that maybe when I, I mean, I, a lot of games were bolting on multiplayer and I, I don't mm. know if it was for the right reasons. Sure. I mean, the, the, the reality is there's only a few games that really could sustain that. Um, and, uh, and that's a great practical realization because to support a robust multiplayer mode, you really do have to focus heavily on it, yep. almost to the exclusion of everything else, unless you have a, an absolutely massive team or two completely separate teams, yep. which you know a lot of people can't support, a lot of developers can't support. And I can't, like, again, there was never, with this game, there was never a question for us because I just don't, I can't speak to that. I don't have experience sure. doing it. Yeah. And I'm happy, and I'm, but I'm thrilled though that people are recognizing that there is a, there still is a home for single player only games. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> as as somebody who plays a lot of them and looks for the the story, yep. like the story that really gets you and drives you forward. Uh, and I think Jedi is a fantastic example of that because I was completely engrossed, am in completely engrossed in the protagonist's journey. Uh, and it's it's really great because it feels like it's a, it's a story that I haven't heard or seen before when it comes to the Jedi. Yeah. And uh, and it feels sort of a missing piece for me in terms of what I know about Star Star Wars. Sorry, I'm kind of now fanboying a little bit, but hey, keep it going. No <laughs> no issues here. <laughs> I recommend anybody who's listening go out and play this game seriously. Um well, I now that you've you're you're over the hump, you've shipped this fantastic game and you've mentioned that your team, a lot of your team is out taking a break and it's going to come back. What excites you most about 2020 as a player? Well, we got new hardware coming. Okay. Um, and that doesn't just excite me as a player. It, it excites me. It excites, excites me as a um, developer. It always keeps things interesting. Um, uh, of course, we've got a uh, uh, little game called Last of Us Two. Yes, coming up. Can't wait um, for that. And that's that's going to be. Um, it's going to be amazing to see where they take that. It's got to be one of the most anticipated games we've seen but yep um but yeah i mean it's I, i'm hoping to see more single player games um and uh um well you got ghost of Tsushima as well um and I, is that coming out next year i don't i don't know actually okay. i have no idea when it is but i just i just know that's one of the games that was announced when was it last year yeah and it's just it's just again another great example of a storied based what i think i guess is a single player game that's yeah. my assumption because again they've been they, they've shared enough to i think get everybody really excited about it yeah we haven't seen anything to contradict that so yeah and i don't have any inside information just saying <laughs> i don't <laughs> i really don't um what about cloud gaming um I, are you in regards to like cloud computing or in terms of like well, oh, there's, playing there's streaming games like Stadia, Stadia, and, XCloud. Like there, yeah. there are a lot of services now that are spinning up and are promising a, a different 
experience in terms of immediate accessibility and uh, upgrades, right? Instead of having to buy a console. I love the promise. Okay. I love the idea of being able to play a game on my TV with just a single controller. And then, you know, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, get on an airplane or something like that and be, I guess you, the airplane would have to have an internet connection. So that might not be the best example, but to be able to sit in my hotel yeah. and play it on my phone or my tablet, um, the same game, the save is up on the cloud. Um, who wouldn't like that? Yeah. And especially like if you're, if you're playing it off of like just hardware, that's just really hard to keep up with. And to, I mean, it seems like having the best PC gear is a constant Right, you got. I mean, you got to be uh, invested, and it's a lot of work to 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 keep up with that. So the promise is great. Um, be instantly being able being able to get the game and play it, you know, all that. Uh, it's right there. I haven't gotten my hands on any of it yet, um, and I just have to go by what I've I've read in the reviews, and and I, I think this is something that like it's a wait and see. Yeah, it was going to evolve. Yeah, I mean, what's what's I think what's pretty cool is that. Once again, games are evolving. The yeah. industry is evolving. I mean, to your point about the new consoles uh, and and what's happening in the cloud with, with cloud gaming, I mean, there's a lot of cool things to be excited about as a as both developer and and player right now. Yep. Uh, what is? But as a developer, what's one area you'd like to see our industry advance? I, you know, this is something I would I would say. 10 years ago, but I feel like now um, the industry is not um, as as open to taking risks um, on the games themselves. Um, but I feel like there's 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 big franchises and, you know, this is coming from somebody who just was working on one of the biggest, you know, and I'm not it's not I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. It's just that, like, when I see something like Death Stranding come out and it's got this huge like blockbuster budget and everything. I think that's great. And I'd like to see more of that. Um, I don't think that we need to be, sequels are great too, but um, to see more fresh ideas mm -hmm. and have, um, you know, the the people that are, are, are um, funding those embrace that. Um, but I can see why that's tough. I mean, you, you, you got, you've got a business and um, there's shareholders um, and, uh, and also people like playing sequels as well too. But this, to me, this isn't just a thing about games. It's, it's, it's kind of um, something that we're seeing more in, in film as well too. It's like everything seems to be like a, a sequel of like the, whatever the big block blockbuster is. Um, and there's a space for that. I, I just also think I mean, there's, there's a, people want to see new things yeah, absolutely. as well too. And I, th I think it's interesting like when you're watching um, like television shows like um, Netflix shows or I think they're they're actually more um, they're, they're less opposed to taking risks um, because we're seeing a lot of interesting things and new ideas come out of those types of shows. Yeah. So um, that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Just more great ideas that make me think in ways that I haven't already experienced. That's excellent. Stig, thank you so much for spending all the time talking about your experiences, about Jedi and, and the future. Thanks for having me, Ted. This has been awesome. Thank you for joining us for the Game Makers Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.